What's up everybody, this is Professor Keegan and this is a video lecture on our asynchronous material for the end of this unit on thinking queerly, questioning progress narratives. Um, now in this section, we've been looking at the dominant progress narratives in our culture that tend to get um, kind of inculcated to us around the supposed progress that LGBTQ people have made since the bad old oppressive days. And remember that we've been practicing non-teleological and non-monolithic thinking around how history and the history of LGBTQ people particularly gets, tends to get packaged in mainstream discourse. So in this last section, we are looking at some interventions from trans activists um, into the assumptions around visibility and representation in the media. Um, and so this is our last um, little unit on thinking queerly, questioning progress narratives. And we're looking at some pieces that really question the value of media representation for trans people, um, asking us to kind of resist applying the same logics that maybe gay, lesbian, and bisexual people have applied to media representation, um, questioning whether those same strategies are really good for trans people or not. Uh, I'm starting out with this image of Laverne Cox, who you might know. She's a famous trans actor who uh, starred on Orbs as the New Black. And back in 2014, Time Magazine ran an image of her on its cover, which was the first time this had ever happened for a trans person. Um, the first trans person ever featured on this magazine cover. And at the time, um, this article of the transgender tipping point, um, basically the author claimed that um, Laverne Cox getting this role on a major TV show was like an indication that like we were heading into a period in which transgender rights would be massively expanded and that we were entering a new civil rights period around the issue of trans um, equality. What happened after that was, I'm sure you know, <laughs> two years later, um, the election of the current administration and a dramatic rescinding of a lot of provisional protections that have been put in place for trans people late in the Obama era. So this author was wrong. Um, and we might want to think a little critically about assumptions we make about representation and whether they translate into actual social and political gains or not. So. Um, we looked at a couple of pieces here, and I wanted to clip out a couple of quotes and talk you through them because I think it's, this is maybe a position we're the least familiar with because it's coming directly from the trans community and it's coming from particularly authors who are um, critical even of white transgender politics. So they're saying like, what are the implications of visibility for say, people of color who are also transgender um, for whom visibility is often dangerous. Um, so as I, as I read these, I'd like you to be thinking a little bit about what these quotes mean and how they are connected to the idea of being visible and whether or not visibility is always a good thing. Um, and if not, then who tends to lose out when we make you know, minority populations visible in certain ways? The first quote, right? Um, this comes from the introduction to Trapdoor. At the same time, we know that when produced within the cosmology of racial capitalism, the promise of positive representation ultimately gives little support or protection to many, if not most, trans and gender non-conforming people, particularly those who are low income and or of color, the very people whose lives and labor constitute the ground for the figuration of this moment of visibility. This is the trap of the visual. It offers, or more accurately, it is frequently offered to us as, the primary path through which trans people might have access to livable lives. So I was hoping maybe you kind of stopped here when you were reading, as this is an important place in the material where these authors are saying that, you know, visibility can be a trap. It can be a way of um, kind of formulating a, a kind of recognizability around trans bodies that then when the, the public starts to become aware of you know, the existence particularly of transgender women, um, people become hyper vigilant about finding these people and punishing them or, pers or like abusing them or discriminating against them. So they say the promise of positive representation ultimately gives little support or protection to many trans people. And so, you know, we assume that just because the media is maybe positively representing trans characters in fictional ways, that somehow translates into better treatment in society. And these authors are saying, not as long as we're not doing the work of 
thinking about the racial dynamics of like white trans visibility versus uh, sort of like black or brown trans, um, you know, oppression. Um, how do those, how are the two, those two things linked? Here we have the author saying, um, this is from the second piece, uh, as the writers in this section make clear, recognition may have arrived, but justice for transgender people has not yet begun. So keep in mind that recognition and justice are different. Recognition can be positive or negative. Um, just because someone recognizes you as trans doesn't mean that they are recognizing you for good reasons. Um, so, and in what ways are we encouraged to accept recognition rather than just actual justice? And what makes those things different? And um, how can we get better at telling when recognition is shallow or tokenizing um, or incomplete um, and actually push for something better, which might not be tied to the logics of visibility at all? Um, another quote here, and this again is from the Against the Day um, section in South Atlantic Quarterly. The author writes, the title of this section, Unrecognizable, it's intended to highlight a conviction shared by these essays that even if recognition is inevitable, we may not always want to be identified. And I hear, I hear, I think they're saying like, there is value in resisting being visible in certain ways. Like particularly if there are all these mechanisms of surveillance and, and policing that are interested in locating and punishing and incarcerating trans people for um, various criminalized behaviors um, then maybe not being identified actually has benefits, right? So the logic of like claiming your identity and being out and proud and visible, um, those logics may have worked for gay and lesbian people in ways that they are not necessarily working for trans people because trans people's forms of difference are different from gay and lesbian forms of difference, right? Gay and lesbian people you generally cannot well, generally they can pass as straight if they choose to. Trans people um, generally cannot 100% pass as cis, no matter what they do. Um, so those logics of identification and identity politics aren't necessarily as safe or as, or as useful to trans people. And lastly, um, being somebody, being a somebody means visibility, becoming a population, becoming a demographic, becoming part of a class, becoming clockable. In all these contexts, it means having to arm yourself with your brokenness. I think here what the authors are noting is that becoming a somebody like accountable type of person also means becoming detectable as that type of person. And so um, when they say becoming clockable, clockability is kind of a uh, like trans culture term for when you can tell someone is trans just by looking at them or by the way they move or talk. Um, so, you know, it's both, it's dangerous to be clockable and it's um, one of the ways in which cis people police trans people's behaviors. Um, so is it such a good thing to be a somebody if the way that you become a somebody carries all these inherent dangers, right? So those were just some aspects of the reading I wanted to pull out as key moments where these authors are articulating reasons why maybe trans people wouldn't want a ton of media coverage or wouldn't want necessarily a ton of media representation or stories about us or characters modeled on us um, in TV or movies because it tends to it tends to alert cis people to our presence while also not really substantively shifting the terms of trans people's oppression in any major way. It just kind of relies on the idea that cis people will accept us and love us. And we found that that isn't necessarily the case um, over the past several years, right? So this is all to say that inclusion in the media or visibility or having characters that are trans you know, we've or gay, we've often kind of thought about that as another kind of progress narrative. Like, well, first queer people were invisible and erased, but then we got representation and we got images of gay life and trans life in the media. And that then was a way for straight and cis people to get to know that we're just like them and we're not a threat when we're actually people. And so now 
um, all the progress we've seen is because like of these representations. And these, that's a progress narrative. And what we found over the last few years is that representation does not necessarily lead to robust social change and often can actually be weaponized against populations. Um, so we could think about how, again, these errors show up in that progress narrative, right? Assuming that visibility and representation will improve trans people's lives um, engages in the monolithic error because it assumes that trans people's problems are the same as maybe cisgender, gay, and lesbian people's problems, and the, and the solution to those problems will work for trans people when the conditions of transphobic policing are different from the conditions of say heteronormativity or even homophobia these are different these are di interconnected but different problems and so to think of them as the same is a kind of monolithic error and two assuming um, that just because we've gotten more representation means that we are heading toward a kind of um, end goal of liberation or equality um, is again another kind of teleological error where we kind of substitute um, positive representation for actual social change. Um, and we're encouraged to kind of collaborate in that substitution by all kinds of, um, you know, capitalist functions in the, in the media. Like just watch this show or just, just buy this thing and because you're included and you're represented uh, and that means that you're actually, um, you're actually socially and politically equal, which isn't necessarily the case. So be thinking about those errors and how they show up here. Um, now remember, we are mapping all of these kind of thinking queerly topics along lines of um, kind of a non-binary um, model. So again, remember, um, there's a conservative or right-wing con position to including and representing trans people um, in the media or in you know, television or in journalism or really anywhere. And again, that con position is also exclusionary and anti-assimilationist. So these folks would say, we wanna keep trans people out of our bathrooms, of our stories, of our schools, right? Of our locker rooms. We don't want them to assimilate. Um, and this discourse is usually based on a presumed natural superiority of cisgender bodies over transgender or intersex bodies. Um, you know, um, and then the result is erasure or negative representations of transgender people that align with that narrative of, of inferiority. So we're probably pretty familiar with this column as like sort of what we would call the transphobic position to trans visibility and representation. And over the years, we have seen a liberal, moderate, or pro position develop in response that wishes to include and assimilate trans people into media discourse and into things like television shows and get more kinds of stories about trans people in the movies, um, to include trans people into those kind of cultural locales where um, cis people can become familiar with us. Um, and this is all based on this kind of, again, um, position or the assumption that increased visibility will improve how trans people are treated by cis people. Um, that somehow making people familiar with us will make them accept us. And again, this is based on an earlier mode by which gay and lesbian people were kind of demanding uh, really back in the, the 80s and 90s that more positive stories about, about gay and lesbian and bisexual people would improve social treatment of those groups. So we see also how there's a bit of a monolithic error there. Um, and so the solution here would be, or the effect would be adding positive representations of trans people to dominant culture. Um, and that's really what we often see um, people asking for is like, oh, if we just get more stories, if we just get more faces, if there's just, if there's just more trans celebrities, um, then transphobia and trans antagonism will decrease. And what we've found is that isn't actually the case. What we found is that perhaps very gender normative, white, middle class trans people are treated more equally, but there's, it doesn't tend to change how 
gender non-conforming, non-white or poor trans people are treated at all because they are so far away from this not normative position that tends to get represented in the media of like the normal looking trans person, the non-scary trans person. And so these authors are again writing from a sort of third non-binary position that we might call a radical or left-wing position um, against these kinds of representations. And they are saying that they're anti-assimilationists. They don't necessarily want to wed the success of trans people's acceptance or non-acceptance to these dominant modes of media discourse. Um, and they're really basing their critique on this awareness that visibility does indeed increase policing, violence, and exclusion of certain types of, of trans and intersex people. Um, which makes me think about how last class we were talking about who watches who, right? Or who watches whom, I guess. Um, when someone, someone brought up, um, I think that, you know, the structure of policing and slavery are very much the same in the case of like, or even prisons, in the case of which group gets to watch and which group is watched. And here we see the same kind of problem with like, trans people offer it as, as objects or images for cis people to watch. And this column of people would say, we need to be aware of that and we need to be thinking about how visibility is a mechanism of policing, it's a mechanism of violence, and it's a mechanism of like marking and targeting people that trans people might actually want to avoid have happening to them. And so instead of adding positive representations um, or positive, right, or what cis people might think of as positive representations of trans people to dominant culture, these activists argue that we need to develop networks of care and mutual aid within the trans community and within the queer community or within justice communities that do not depend on acceptance by cisgender people. That, you know, um, we can't rely on our oppressors to give us justice I think you can see this truth if you look at the history of the United States, that justice is always won um, by demanding, um, you know, demanding that the oppressor become accountable and give up certain modes of, of authority and power over the oppressed. Uh, the oppressor doesn't tend to just willfully give those things up. Um, and so if we want to be self-actualized as a community, we need to do this work without relying on cis people and their um, feelings toward us. So again, thinking about some of the consequences of like who gets represented and then how that maybe trickles down in the community and who gets harmed. Um, we know that since the transgender tipping point um, in 2014, the following year had the highest rate of anti-trans violence on record in the United States. So something there is connected, right? Um, more representation doesn't necessarily mean less violence. So um, wrapping the unit up, we're ending thinking queerly. Um, some things to be thinking about for your journals, so some broad questions, and you can attack these in any way you'd like. We had a day on um, public safety, policing, and prisons, as well as patriotism. Um, and then this day on visibility and representation. Um, Right, some thoughts about some takeaways from this unit on thinking queerly. Remember, I'm gonna ask you for major concepts and then themes. Um, and then also in the reflection section, you might kind of check back on your thinking even just two weeks ago and start trying to track the new kinds of questions you're asking now um, or how your lens has shifted. I think articulating that is, is really good for metacognitive um, tracking in this class. And also we're about to just dive into pre-colonial America with this new set of hopefully critical skills that you've been building in the unit. So some things to think about. Um, I'm going to leave it there, and um, I will talk to you next week. Okay, be well.